Uh, good evening, everyone. Maybe we will wait for a couple of minutes for people to join. Uh, good evening all this is dr ankur lad scientific manager pariva medical your host for today let me welcome you all to this interesting and unique webinar which is being held for the first time in india yes a rare opportunity to learn all about digital morphology as we all are aware manual microscopy comes with many limitations digital imaging or morphology makes use of digital images and software algorithm to classify hematological cells cellar vision technology provides a new and more efficient approach to performing cell differentials the automation offered by this technology removes the laborious and tedious aspects of performing cell differential giving medical technologies more time to focus on what really matters is the detection of abnormal cells and best in class experience to clinicians with this it brings a new era it has improved advanced and transformed the process of analyzing blood and body fluids integration of digital imaging with cell counter results could lead to a faster detection and higher sensitivity and specificity in the detection of hematological malignancies and we all would agree that this relatively a new arena will generate considerable interest and will have us absorbed for a long time as this is the future and who can deny the fact it's ever emerging utility i mean digitalization in current pandemic area and furthermore digital imaging can be used as an excellent learning and technology tool as you all are aware that horiba medical always strives and is highly focused towards ensuring customer delight consistency and advancement have been our main forte in our journey towards the same we collaborated with cella vision to bring you the series of webinars six weeks six sessions 60 minutes each and we will be covering introduction and evolution technology and application utility and morphology of the cell and body fluids by our esteemed speakers across the globe and the most important and fascinating part will be case presentation in the last three webinars so now coming to the today's session introduction and evolution we will be covering what is an automated digital cell morphology system how and where the system has developed 
how they have evolved over the years throwback from the 70s to the 21st century and how the digital cell morphology aims to improve the hematology workflow today today's session will mainly consist of history and evolution and i would request you all to type your questions and uh, in the chat box given without wasting much time to begin the session i would like to call our speaker elena <coughs> elena balskan she is director application and clinical support from cella vision sudan she is a biomedical laboratory scientist based at the cella vision headquarters in sudan she worked in clinical chemistry lab mainly in hematology before joining cella vision in 2015 and as a director of application and clinical support she manages teams of product specialists and play a crucial role in everything from development processes and clinical studies to training and supporting distributors and your end users welcome elena over to you thank you dr rankur for that introduction and that warm welcome and uh, thank you for having me and inviting salavision to do this webinar series with you uh My name is Elena Bergskans as Ankur introduced I'm the director of application and clinical support here at Cellvision and I will take you through today's lecture that we call introduction and evolution um the objectives for today's session is to try and describe what is an automated digital uh, cell morphology what is it and what is the system We, I also want to describe the history behind the automated digital cell morphology system. Where uh, where do they come from? Where are we today? But also, I would like to try and describe the improvements that have been done in performing manual differential with help of digital uh, cell morphology systems. But before I go into that, I want to tell you just a bit short. Who are Cellvision? Who are we? We were founded back in 1994, uh, so we are getting old, I would say. Um, we were founded by a med medical student called Christophorius, uh, who thought that when he was doing manual differentials during his stu uh, studies, that it must be an easier or better way to actually do this uh, procedure that he thought was quite time. um uh, time consuming our headquarter is based in the southern parts of sweden in lund where we have a close collaboration with lund university as well globally we are 160 employees and as you can see from the map here in the uh, in the slide we are uh, located very uh, globally and we have a direct presence in more than 40 countries Uh, both Americas, um, Asia, uh, of course, Europe, Russia, Australia, and so on. And we have two segments when it comes to our products, both human and veterinary, uh, where we have systems that is targeted both towards large uh, laboratories, but also mid-sized and small. And um, for the veterinary segment, we can do analysis uh, for almost. Uh, all animals but we have trained network for feline canine and also avians so that was a little bit short about who we are uh, so let's dig into today's lecture and i want to start with just a short description of what is an automated digital cell morphology system well i would say that it has three cornerstones it is an automated microscope based system that has a uh, camera and an image analysis software and this image analysis software it helps the system to identify a monolayer that is the, the area that it chooses to do the differential for both white cells blood cells and red blood cells it helps to locate individual cells and capture high quality cell images and to be able to perform this pre-classification of blood cells that the system does it uses analysis image analysis technology and artificial intelligence that has been trained to know and recognize what is a cell once that procedure is done the images are then presented to a medical technologist on a computer screen for the final verification because what it is what is important to remember here is that the system provides you with a pre 
classification. That means that it's a suggestion. And in the end, the final classification that is reported out, it's up to the medical technologist to do that. So that is a digital cell morphology system, short. But let's uh, jump back in time. And how did it look in the early days when digital cells morphology systems was firstly developed? We have to go back oh, all the way, I was almost about to say. We have to go back to the 70s where the first attempts were done to develop uh, digital cell morphology systems. I listed uh, three, three, four different types of systems and companies here, and I will talk uh, a little bit about some of them. The first was an American company uh, that released a, a system called the DIF-3. This uh, system required spun samples and not wedged smears that was perhaps more commonly used under the microscope. It did a pre-classification of 10 cell classes. And back in the 70s, um, AI wasn't developed or neural intel uh, artificial intelligence wasn't, wasn't developed. So they used something called uh, a rule-based classification instead. And that is when you take, um, you use a so-called decision tree. So you take different aspects and measurements of the cell uh, and um, try to put them in the right cell class depending on how big the nucleus is, how much cytoplasm it has, how big the cell is, and use uh, um, that as the pre-classification. It could ra run 14 slides uh, per batch as well. So quite a high throughput, I would say, um, for being developed that early. Next one that was um, developed was in the early 80s. Uh, this Hematric 590 was developed also by an American company. And it was, as you can see from the image here, it was quite a large instrument. Um, and it consisted of two computers. So it had one that they called a morphological computer and one that they called a recognition computer. And this is due to that back in those days, the computers wasn't as advanced or had a capability of having so much storage on them that we have today. And you can see here, we also had the ocular and, and the manual way of looking and a quite small computer screen. But this system, it actually extracted 100 cell features to be able to do a pre-classification. And it was actually able to use wedged smears. And I think that was one of the reasons to why this system was quite a success back in those days and sold actually around 1,000 systems globally, which I would say is really impressive uh, in, in the 80s. Next uh, system or uh, uh, company that tried to develop this was um, the Omron Microx HEG 120. This system also required spun samples and not wedged smears. But this had quite a huge capacity. As you can see, it could run 120 slides per hour. I would say that's very impressive. Uh, and that you, this system also use, uses, uh, used the decision tree for pre-classification, just as the, the DIF-3 did. So, but around this time in the late 70s, beginning of 80s as well, uh, the development of cell counters had also started. Um, and there is actually an article that was published um, that is called the potential impact of extended differential count in the clinical laboratory. And this article describes the methods for both differentials and, and CBC counts that they were quite time consuming. Uh, and uh, the attempt to automate this um, took, they, I would say, as this described two directions in the 70s. It was digital imaging, just what we have looked at for the previous slides, but also flow cytometry or flow through analysis. And um, the initial or the first actually flow through analyzer that was developed, it was developed by an American company called Technicon. 
And this company is was later Bayer, that some of you might be familiar with. Um, and they actually managed to develop an instrument that provided a five-part differential just using a blood tube. So this development of three-part and five-part differential system, and then using uh, electronic impedance, resistance, or laser light scatter, this provided an, um, the users with an instrument that had a greater sensitivity, of course, and also ability to count thousands of cells uh, instead of the digital imaging system that could count roughly 100 and 200 cells. So as this article described, this actually led to the death blow of image processing devices in the 80s. But people never give up and we're thankful for that. So there were some attempts in the 90s as well to be able to come up with digital morphology. Uh, the Omron HEG 50, that was um, a smaller variant than the one we saw from the previous slides. This was developed by a Japanese company. Uh, we have the iComposcope, and uh, that was an Israeli company that no longer exists. And then it was the IMI Micro 21. This was developed by an American company. And they had actually a couple of systems out in the American market. And actually this company was later bought by Cellavision and the technology behind it uh, was adapted by us. So that was just a slight go through from 70s, 80s, 90s and attempts that were done then. And that leads us on to the modern age of cell morph digital cell morphology systems. Where are we now? So in the early 2000, uh, there were actually <clears throat> uh, easier or the attempts to try and develop things uh, were a bit easier because the conditions surrounding digital cell morphology were improved quite a lot. Uh, for example, artificial neural networks, machine learning, deep learning, all those things were um, new and exciting and made it easier and more reliable to train a computer brain, so to say, to recognize cells and classify them. There was also easier way to um, develop more application. We could have smaller footprints than the ones we saw uh, from the previous slides. Uh, and of course, a great reason for this was that it was faster computers. As you see from the example here uh, on the slide, in 74, uh, a processor had 4,500 transistors, and in 2002, another one had 55 million transistors. So we can do the math <laughs> and just realize that it had been a huge huge in, um, uh, change in, in computer and technology. And due to this as well, that we have had this highly improved IT uh, structures made it also easier and more possible to work with things like IT integration. Can we, um, and LIS communication, can we connect the LIS system of the lab to the digital cell morphology system as well, and actually don't need to write the results down manually and add them into the LIS. It can be transferred automatically. And of course, since uh, computers were uh, cheaper and could have much more storage room, it was also easier to store more images and in that way also then make uh, the analysis uh, bigger and run more cells, for example. So there were some quite uh, improvements here in the early 2000s that made it uh, perhaps easier to develop and, and um, tackle our, uh, take, take our way into the laboratory. So, so the journey then that Cellavision has done, you can see our all our analyzers here that has been developed from the early days up to today. So our first system was released in the 2000. It was called DiffMaster Octavia. 
And that was a microscope uh, that had a camera on top of it. Uh, it had a cap capability of loading eight slides on a stage. So it, it had some sort of continuous feed. And then it came with a computer and software that the customers then reclassified their cells in. And it performed both white uh, blood cell differential and presented an RBC overview for the customer. A couple of years later, there had been a demand or a need, as we saw it, to target large labs that run perhaps 100 or 200 slides a day. So then we developed the DM96. Uh, and the difference here was you loaded the slides into a magazine and each magazine could hold 12 slides and you could load eight slides at the uh, eight magazines at the same time uh, on this system. It, it would just continue to run until, uh, until it was finished. So um, that was our first bigger system that was released. A couple of years later, uh, we released the DM8, which is based on the same platform, the same generation as the DM96, but then targeted the smaller labs uh, and could only run eight slides at the same time. And as development goes quickly, or we need to uh, be, be here and now, we developed an, another, a new generation in 2008. Then we released the DM1200 that had the same principle of running slides in a magazine, loading 12 slides into a magazine, but it only uh, can run one magazine at a time. That hence the name DM1200. And this system targeted more mid-sized lab that perhaps was too small to buy a DM96, but too big to just have the DM8. And this system is available today still. And then a couple of years later, we uh, released uh, the um, DI60 in 2013. That builds on the same platform as the 1200 and is an integrated system together with the seismic hematology line. But as I said, we need to be up to date. So it was time around 2015 to release uh, a big instrument, but on our new platform. So then we released the DM9600, which then is the sibling to the uh, DM96. That is our large system that runs multiple, uh, has continuous feed and runs um, up to uh, eight magazines at once. So, and then last year, 2020, we launched the latest system that we have in our little family, which is called the DC1. This system targets small labs. You can only run one slide at a time on this and you load it manually and you apply the oil manually. Uh, but uh, it can be connected to our other system and it performs the pre-classification just as the other instrument. And this is then also then building on a new generation and a new platform. So here we are today. In 2021, we have three generation of system, systems behind us. Um, and what we have worked hard on over the last years is not just only to develop new products or hardwares and applications, but also to work uh, with connectivity. Since all these IT structures has been improved and made it easier for us, we have chosen to work quite hard to giving the labs an opportunity and a possibility to work together with sharing images and patients' information and so on in an easier way. And that is something, of course, that we will talk about more over this session for the next weeks. So let's move on. So that was a bit of the historical part from the 70s to where we are today and uh, the products that Salavision has developed. But what is then Salavision's goal or our aim with our pro products? Of course, we want to make an improvement in performing manual differentials. If we look at manual differentials today, doing it in the microscope, it is very laborious. It is time consuming. 
uh, but it's also very highly dependent on the availability of experienced personnel. We all know how difficult it is to learn blood cell morphology. It not, it's not something you learn in a week or two. It takes years to, to, be, to be really good at it and to be perhaps comfortable in reporting uh, a result and perhaps differ um, a promyelocyte from a blast, for example. But it also struggles, I would say, with bad ergonomics. And even though if the microscopes today are becoming better and better, it still struggles with that, with neck pain and sore shoulders and all those stuff. So we have made it our business to help lab modernize this uh, routine procedure, so to say. And instead of looking down a microscope, sitting uh, in front of the computer screen, looking at multiple cells at once and working together. So our vision is to be a leader in the global digitalization and automation of blood analysis. And here it is, as you remember now, both for the human and for the veterinary segments. So we have an aim for both of those segments to do that. So we see that our method that we use contributes to improve both patient diagnostic, streamlining and reduced healthcare, healthcare costs. And we are a bit, uh, I would say cocky when we say that our mission is to replace traditional microscopes in the lab laboratories. And I think we're on a good way to do that. Uh, but remember here, replace the microscope, not replacing, the medical technologies. Because as you remembered from what I said in the beginning, an automated digital cell morphology system performs a pre-classification. The post-classification and the final result that always needs to be done by a medical technologist and the in-depth knowledge that all those people have around the world when it comes to blood cell morphology. So, so what is it then that makes lab buy our system and implement them and, and put in the time and effort it takes to move from something that is manual to a bit more automated? I've listed a couple of things here and I think all of you can recognize yourself when, when I say that, that it is tough in, in today's healthcare globally. Uh, there is a pressure to do more with less. There are increased sample volumes and especially now when we are going through a pandemic worldwide, I think all of us can say that the healthcare in our region has been very, very pushed to, to, towards the, to a limit. There is also a shortage of skilled personnel. Uh, and I would say that that's a global view. Yesterday was the International Biomedical Laboratory Science Day. And I think that was highlighted all around the world. And just here in Sweden, they say that we are going to la uh, lack uh, three and a half thousand med tech in just 15 years. And to us, which is a small country, uh, that is quite a lot. And who will do the job uh, if there are no people to hire and people don't uh, educate themselves to become a medical technologist? There is also a demand for sure of shorter turnaround times. I think we've all been there where you know, you get a sample and the clinician calls and say, where is my answer? You want it as quick as possible because the, the customer and um, the patient is really sick. So that's also something that we want to help the labs with to, to uh, decrease the turnaround times. And I think when we talk generally about lab work or labs, um, that there is a need for consistency, standardization, traceability, quality control. And that's also something that, that we see are a bit lacking when you use a manual microscope, perhaps. Here, there will be a traceability. The images and the differential results can be stored for, I would say, as long as the customer would like, which makes it easier to track back and see how a patient has been classified. And then also compare what did the patient look like last week when it came and how does it look today? And we can compare the blast cells and we can compare the neutrophils, for example, with previous results in a much easier way. 
There is also a need now for new levels of connectivity and remote access. I mean, it is the 21st century and um, I think everyone wants to be more remotely. They want to be able to access patients. Pathologists, for example, wants to be able to access patients from home. They don't want to go in to look perhaps under the microscope for one slide. They want to be able to, to have an easy access to patient results. So all of these challenges, what is what has made us develop uh, our concept? And I just want to track back again to what we talked about in the beginning. What is the digital cell morphology system? We have the automation. Um, that is the hardware, the systems that makes it a bit faster. We have the artificial intelligence that is trained to recognize cells. And of course, then the digitalization moving towards screens and softwares and applications. So how do we then take our concept into the lab world? Well, we have four cornerstones. What is digital cell morphology to us? And what it is, is that we want to then improve the efficiency. And here it is that the system, as I've described, we automatically locates, captures, and pre-classify the cells. And then the cells are presented for review by the technologist. So that means that the technologist, they don't have to look, look manually under the microscope, search for a good area to do the differential, and spend time uh, worrying about the correct area or the correct battlement track and so on. Uh, we also want to work on the quality concept. And here it is that when you replace the manual microscope, we want it to be with a more standardized process. So that means when we look for a monolayer, the system will always look the exact same way. We have a fixed starting position. Uh, we will talk about this more next week. So, so just wait for that. Uh, and you will see also a higher perhaps consistency between technologists or shifts or sites because they will be presented with the same images from the same patient uh, if they are helping each other out, for example. So it is easy to ask for a second opinion. Um, and also, as I said, then they look at the same images so they make the same judgment from the sample. Um, and we also then want to improve the connectivity between labs. Uh, and we want to see it as that differential will become a collaborative process and actually make better use of both staff and the skills that the staff has. And being able to perhaps report out quicker um, and faster and much more occurring um, than using a manual microscope. So that our way to connect labs together. If you're located in a large network, you can all share the same database or you can log into each other databases and help each other out and consult each other. And lastly, uh, promote proficiency. So here you're helped in a day-to-day -day work using the Salivation software, you can, for example, uh, pull up reference cells that comes with the software. You can create your own reference cells to help the technologist compare and discuss. Uh, and you can also review cells grouped side by side. You can compare myelocytes and promyelocytes next to each other and see the differences and the similarities between those cell types. And that makes it easier for the staff to work together. And of course, lastly, we off offer also a tool to assess, track, uh, and promote staff competency. So you can train and teach uh, your staff so they feel comfortable in reporting differentials. So how do we then do this? Well, we have, as you know by now, we have a set of hardwares or instruments, that, that is our way to improve the efficiency by our hardwares, because that will make it faster uh, for, the, for the labs to run their slides. When it comes to promote the quality, we have different applications 
we have the peripheral blood application. That is the core of all system that comes from cell division. That uh, performs a, a WBC differential. It presents you with an RBC overview and makes it possible for you to um, report a platelet estimate. Then we have two more advanced soft, uh, applications, the advanced RBC application and a body fluid application. And these applications will be more in depth described uh, next week and the week after that. And when we talk about connectivity, we have developed uh, different softwares for this. We have remote review software, which is a software that, for example, the pathologist can install at their home office and then connect to the database in the lab and being able to reclassify and sign off slides from home. We have the uh, server software, which is a software that makes it possible to host your database on a server and then being able to share that in a huge network. You can share the same database and also you can store more slides. And then lastly, we have the dashboard application. And that is um, an application or a software that makes it a, a possible for a lab to see real time status. How many slides are waiting? How many slides are stat? How many instruments are up and running? Where has the QC control been, been done and where hasn't it, for example? And then lastly, for promoting proficiency, we have a product called Cellavision Proficiency Software, which is a web-based program that is used by labs and schools all around the world, uh, teaching and training uh, blood cell morphology. And then we have our Cell Atlas app. And that is an app that is available both for iPhone and Android uh, with little lectures in morphology, but also a little quiz that you can take your uh, take as a test and see what you need to, to perhaps read up on. Uh, and as I said, uh, over these next two weeks, we will dig in more in depth in all these products and I will show you how you work with them, what enhancements uh, there are and how you can use them in your day-to-day -day work. So with that, I just want to say thank you for listening to this webinar. Um, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to, to answer. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Elena, for taking us through the journey of digital cell morphology. Uh, your insights into evolution, history, and need of digital cell morphology were enlightening. And now, coming to the question and answer session, we also have Mr. Parag Taukar. Uh, he has more than 24 year experience in IVD industry at various levels, including application support, management, leadership roles in sales and marketing. Parag is currently working with Cellavision since 2018. He is based in Mumbai, India, uh, and handling South Asian countries. Welcome, Parag. Thanks, thanks, Ankur. Thanks, Dr. Ankur. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Huriba and, in, <clears throat> of course, Dr. Gautam for giving us this opportunity. Um, uh, it was a great lecture, Adina. Thanks for that. It was really insightful on even for us to know so much details about the history uh, behind cell, digital cell morphology. So a really interesting lecture. Uh, I must, in fact, tell the crowd that and the attendees uh, a big thank you to you. And you'll see in the coming lectures a lot more in detail about uh, the Cellavision products that we have, the software and the applications that it uses, and of course, from a, a technologist's point of view, from a pathologist's point of view, and even from an administrator point of view, how these systems will be useful in the days to come in the laboratory, especially now in these pandemic times that you know we have restrictions of travel, we have resources uh, limitations. So I'm sure you will see a lot of benefits and value from these presentations in the days to come. Once again, thanks, and we are open to questions that uh, anyone has uh, for us? Yes, Parag, I will take. Uh, 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 first question is from uh, Dr. Parag Dharap. What is the time limit for using retained sample? 
uh, with retained sample, I mean, you, you mean the blood tube itself? Um, and yes. Yes. And here we have a limit that the blood smear needs to be made within four hours after it has been drawn to be able to get the best um, out of the out of the smear. Uh, like uh, if it, uh, it's not run in the first four hours, like why, what difference can it make on the smear? It can make a, a difference in how the, for example, the RBCs are distributed and also the white cells. But what we've seen mostly is that old samples, when they are smeared, is that the RBCs will change its shape. Uh, and that then makes it more difficult for the system to, to find a, a good monolayer area. And also it is more difficult to actually create a good monolayer area when making the smear. Okay, uh, fine. Uh, I think uh, we are good to go. Um, second question is from Mr. Siddharth Sharma. How good is the software in picking, picking up parasites, especially malaria? Uh, we have in the advanced RBC software that we will talk about next week more in depth, we have a uh, uh, we pre-characterize into inclusions where parasites as a general class is available. Okay. So basically so, we, we put it as a parasite uh, or as an inclusion. Uh, and, and like Elena said, you know, these are all systems that give you a pre-classification. It's up to the end user or the technologist or the pathologist to reconfirm. What advantage you have is that once you see an image of the parasite in the RBC on the system, it's it's 100% confirmed and you can store that image for wherever and whenever uh, if someone wants to refer back. So it's 100% confirmation once it's there. If it's not there, there is a chance because you know there is a a certain amount of area that the system covers during uh, doing the analysis. So positive is 100% positive for the, in that case. Uh, and again, you can use and store that image as well. Means it's as good as or as effective as detecting malignancies, right? Oh, yeah. So, so again, malignancies, what will happen is it will pick up blasts and there are several white papers on that, that this is almost 100% sensitive to picking up blasts, even if there is one blast. Uh, so, and there have been white papers published at ISLH as well on that. So it is very sensitive to pick up blast, but it will not classify the blast into different morphologies okay. like a myeloblast. Mm -hmm. That was my second question, which you have already answered. Will it distinguish okay. between blasts? Uh, no, it won't. It will just call it a blast. Okay, uh, fine. Uh, Mr. Jaldeep Ji is asking, can images of abnormal cells be printed on the report? No, it can't. It can't be printed as it is now. Uh, we have a way to send a couple of the abnormal cells uh, to the LIS, um, but it can't be printed on the report at it, as it is now. Okay. Uh, we do we do have uh, softwares. I mean, third party softwares, uh, vendors who can once we transmit the reports or the cell images onto the LIS, then pick it up from there and using their software middleware print it out onto the report. So there are currently a few users in the country who are actually printing an abnormal cell on the report. Uh, but that's through their middleware once the cell is transferred onto the LIS. Okay, uh, fine. I think you have answered this question. Now we have uh, one question in addition to the first question. Uh, like you are all aware that there is marked temperature variation around the world. So Dr. Dharap yeah. is asking, what about ideal temperature range? Should the sample tube should be retained? Is there any specific temperature like range? Well, I, I'm not sure if I'm the expert in answering that question, um, but I would say that, that a hematology sample normally should be stored in room temperature or um, what is that around 20 Celsius degrees. Okay. 
Um, yeah. I'm not an expert in that. I know that when we, when I worked in the lab and we sent uh, samples between us, there was always in a cooler. So I mean, that was definitely lower than 20 degrees. But I think the issues are when it also goes into the high temperatures and the heat is many times more of an issue when you need to transport the sample or the tube itself. Okay, by this I get that uh, it should be uh, stored like the normal sample. Yeah, exactly. It should be stored as the normal hematology sample. I mean, the slide that we we use or the smear that is made should be made from the hematology blood tube, the EDTA tube. Um, yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. So I think I think coming back on that one, it's it's almost similar when we are running samples for hematology systems is, uh, you know, if you look at the ideal temperature at when you should run a sample on an analyzer, within how much time and at what temperature, uh, the reasons are that you would in most probability see variations once you cross that time or you cross that temperature. And those same variations would then reflect onto the the differential when it's once the slide is prepared and then stained and sent into the television system. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, now, Dr. Trupti is asking: Is stain standardization important to run the slides in television? Will it affect the cell counting? Yes, it is. That's a really good question. Um, the slide, when it's put on television, it required to be. Uh, of a specific length, uh, for example, we have in instructions um, how to make a well-made smear in our instructions for use. We have certain criteria. It needs to be a well-made smear that has a good readable monolay area uh, and the stain needs to be of good contrast. So it, it can't be too dark or too light or too red or too blue, for example. We have a, quite a wide range, um, I would say, what we can accept, but it is sensitive. I'm not sensitive, but it is um, of importance that you put in something that is well made. I think I can add to that. It's something like um, what we do for our cell counters is, uh, you know, you require a, a standardized uh, EDTA to blood ratio. You you'd require a good quality of anticoagulant. And once you have a good quality of sample to offer, then the cell counter obviously does its job. Uh, I think it's the same. It's the pre-analytical, which is pretty important even for the digital imaging. Mm. Uh, it's not mandatory to be out of a strainer or out of a slide maker, but it's, it's very important that there is a good quality and consistency in the yeah. slide preparation as well as the slide staining. Yeah, the risk is otherwise, as we have seen uh, when we have run into troubles with the system, is that the distribution of the white cells can be skewed if the slide is or smear is not properly made. And then, of course, the result will be uh, wrong that is reported. So that's why it is of high importance. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the second question, the, another question is from Mr. Jitendra. Does the small DC1 requires special slides or we can do it on ordinary one? No, it doesn't require special slides. Um, it's the same. We have the same principle for all our system um, that, uh, that a wedge smear can be, can be run on that as well. So um, not, nothing more, uh, not, not more difficult to run it on the DC1 than on the other systems in terms of smears. Yeah. Maybe I think where it's coming from is whether it should be a cut edge or a regular slide. So right from a DC1 perspective, you could use the regular glass slide that you're using in the laboratory. Uh, whereas on the DM series and the DI, you need the ones uh, that have the cut edge slides. So for different equipments, we will be needing different type of slides, right? So the automated systems, the DM analyzers or the DI-60s generally are developed for high volume sites who will have or basically want to have a workflow, uh, you know, a smooth workflow and faster turnaround time. So they would have a hematology system attached to a slide maker strainer and then those slides running into the cell vision. So 
the TAT is improved. Uh, so generally, yes, the DM series and the DI series will require the cut edge slides that come out of the slide maker stainers. But the DC1 is developed for more mid size labs and small size labs. So you would then maybe not have the slide maker stainer. So you can still use the regular uh, slides. Okay. And just uh, addition to that uh, question only is barcode yep. one compulsory? Is barcode is compulsory on DC1? No, um, you can run slides without a barcode uh, on, on it on the DC1 because there is an op, uh, option to either type in uh, it manually, the order ID, or if you have a barcode label, you can also scan it. So we have tried to make that system more um, aimed, as I said, towards smaller labs that might not have all these functionalities in being able to create labels, for example, or have the cut uh, cut corner slides, for example. Uh, so so that, that's the difference as well between the systems. Uh, one question also came to my mind. Can we have a bi-directional flow interfacing on Cellavision system? A bi-directional, you mean with your LIS, a bi-directional communication? Yes. 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 Yes, we can. We we support a bidirectional uh, LIS communication. So we receive information from the LIS. We take that into consideration, and the system does what it has been asked to do, and then we send the results back to the LIS or to the middleware. So absolutely. So, okay. so we can do that, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm moving to the next question. Uh, there was one question: Is it important to have automatic slide maker and stainer to run slides on Cellavision? Parag, I think you can answer this. Yeah, I think it's something like I said earlier, the higher end systems were developed so that you have a ease of workflow. So obviously you would have labs which are currently using a cell counter and a slide maker stainer. So the slide runs through uh, the same slide maker stainer, uh, but it's not mandatory. You could have a cell vision as a standalone system you could uh, then prepare a slide outside manually. You could stain it manually. What's important, like I said earlier, is these smearing and staining should be standardized. And that's something that is very difficult uh, manually. I'm not saying impossible, but very difficult, especially looking at the volumes of samples these kind of labs would have. So it is definitely advantages to have, but not mandatory to have. Okay. okay, it seems as a need of the future, distal morphology. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's good. Let me check if there are any more questions. Yeah, uh, one question is from Mr. Siddharth Sharma. Uh, are you using a single algorithm or an ensemble of algorithms for classification? We are using a bunch of algorithms to classify the cells. I will touch up on that a little bit more um, next week when we talk about the principles of operation uh, that we use uh, neural networks, for example, and use a mul multiple characteristics of each cells put together uh, when we do the pre-classification. So we use multiple algorithms. Right, right. Uh, so I leave I that as a cliffhanger. So you will come back next week. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this was just the beginning. We'll be going in detail about the application and everything about the digital morphology. Yes. And now I think there are no more question and questions. Yep. Yeah. Just to add to that one to, I guess that's Dr. Siddharth Sharma, but yeah, I think to add to that, I think all our systems that are currently available are FDA approved. Uh, so uh, there is you know, a standardization in the way we do and there is an approval from the FDA for the way we classify or pre-classify ourselves. Yes. Uh, now there are no more questions. So I think uh, uh, we should close the session. Uh, thank you, Parag, and thank you, Alina, so much for giving us this valuable information and details about digital morphology. Uh, 
and this is for the audience we will also be sending you certificate and questionnaire about the webinar please do answer them and please don't forget to give your suggestions and feedback as it will help us to improve in the next webinar uh, thank you again parag elena and dear audience and i would also like to take this opportunity to thank our customers and partner in progress for believing in us as hoiba has the highest number of installations of cellar vision right parag thank you yeah. yes thank, thank you so much, much. thank yeah. you as this is a Excellent. series of webinars so the next session will be on 23rd april same time 5 to 6 pm and it will be more interesting as it will be technology and application about the digital morphology so thank you all thank you stay safe and most important stay tuned for the next webinar thank you thank you everyone thank you bye bye everyone bye bye